Now it's uh, the, end, the intro credits and now we are online. Okay, great. So thank you for coming. Uh, sorry I'm late. I was running as fast as I could. Um, so here is where we are in the course and this is what we'll talk about uh, this week. So we, last week we talked, we talked, right? So we started the course talking about high dimensional data. We talked uh, about matrices and uh, graph type data. Then we talked about graph embeddings and we transitioned into machine learning, talking about decision trees, SVM, and uh, kind of parallel, massive parallel uh, implementations of machine learning models. And what we wanna do today is to talk about when the use cases when the data is infinite. So what we'll do for the next, week and a half is to talk about uh, infinite data. So when you think of a data stream. So let me explain what a data stream is, right? So uh, um, these are, this happens in, situ in situations where we don't get the entire data set in advance, right? So stream management means when data is kind of coming to you online as, as the time progresses. And if you think about, uh, there are many cases where this input rate is controlled externally, right? If, if you are a social media site, Posts are being uh, generated in real time. So you never have a data set of posts. Th there are always new posts. If you think of search engines and you're seeing, thinking of stream of queries, queries are also coming one, at one after another. You never have a complete data set of queries, right? So this means that we can think of the data as infinite and no station, non-stationary, right? It will change, the distribution will change over time, right? And uh, in some sense, this is the fun part and why uh, why it's interesting and why algorithms are needed. Because data can change over time, uh, data is infinite, you will never see the entire of, the entirety of it, you'll never kind of see, see all of it. That's the idea. So in some sense the way we think of this is that these input elements are uh, in, uh, entering at uh, rapid uh, state um, and you can have multiple kind of input ports, streams that are coming in. And uh, the idea is that you cannot store the entire data set, everything that comes in. So, so the question becomes, how do you make critical calculations? How do you answer queries uh, with a limited amount of memory, but potentially unlimited amount of data, right? That is, that is kind of the goal. So the, the trick in these types of algorithms will always be, how do we save uh, or compose some kind of critical summary of the data so that we can answer queries without needing to save everything we have seen so far. So it will be all about kind of creating summaries of the data, <coughs> right? And just uh, a quick side note, right? Like this on, this streaming algorithms, we can think of them as online algorithms as well, right? And when we were talking about optimization and, stoch uh, and stochastic gradient descent, that in some sense is an example of a streaming algorithm. And there is, and the way we would think of this in machine learning, we call it online learning, right? It's a way that allows us kind of to update the model on the fly as new data is coming in, right? So in some sense, right, the algorithm is able to adapt itself uh, to the changes in the data. And the way you do this is to say, let me do small updates to the model as the model unfolds, right? So um, in stochastic gradient descent, we are making these small updates as new data is coming in. And, and nobody says we have to do kind of multiple passes over our data set. You could, if your data is infinite, just new data points and labels are coming in and you are updating your model. So this is one example of a streaming online uh, like algorithm just to connect it to what we've been talking um, about previously. So here is now how kind of back to streams, how we are going to think about this. We'll think that stream, streams that are coming in into this stream processor, we will have some um, limited amount of uh, um, working storage. There might be some archival storage as well. There will be queries that will be coming in and then we will wanna give answers to these types of queries, right? And I will give you an example. We, what, and what we will talk about is what kind of queries can we answer and what kind of algorithms do we use in here to be able to answer these types of queries, right? So what I wanna talk to you today about is two types of queries that we will wanna uh, talk about. First is we'll wanna sample from a data stream um, and I'll explain what I, what I mean by this. Essentially, we will try to construct a random sample uh, of a stream. And then the other thing we'll try to do is try to answer queries over sliding windows, right? Where we'll ask to say, you know, how many items of type X have occurred in the last K uh, K elements of the stream, right? And if you have a lot of storage, this is easy. You just save 
the last k elements and have a for loop over that says how many of them are of type x. But we don't want to do that. Or, you know, how do you construct a random sample of the stream? One way would be that you save the entire stream on the disk and then take a random sample of that, right? But as the, the stream gets longer, the more you would have to save. So again, we don't want to do that. So this is what we'll talk about today. And then to give you a preview of what we'll talk on Thursday, we'll talk about uh, filtering a data stream. Which, which is a very useful algorithm. Basically, the idea is how do you select elements with property X from the stream, right? And uh, again, this for one type of property might be easy, but if you would like to select items where you have a billion different types of properties, this can become quite expensive. Then we'll talk about how would you count distinct elements in a stream? How do you, and how do, how do you find, uh, how do you estimate moments in some sense? estimate the average or a standard deviation uh, of the entire stream. And last, next week we'll talk about kind of how do you do frequent item sets, frequent elements on top of the stream. So these are types of queries, if you want to think of it that way, that we'll learn how to answer over the stream. Um, now what are the applications of this? There is a lot of applications where basically we want to mine the stream of, let's say, web search queries, right? At Google, you want to know how many queries are more frequent today than they, than, than they were yesterday, right? Um, if you think of click streams, right, people clicking on a website, that is another, that is a stream of clicks that you are observing. So maybe Wikipedia, which is the fifth largest website in the world, or most popular one, it, it will tell you, it wants to know which of its pages are getting an unusual number of hits in the last past hour, right? Or if you are thinking about mining social network news feeds, then you know, how would you identify trending topics on Twitter, Facebook, and so on? Again, that is an example of a streaming problem because people are visiting things, data is coming to you, and you want to do, answer some, some type of queries over those, over those streams. And then I will mention three more applications in sensor networks, right, where you have sensors outside in the environment sensing the environment. That is essentially a stream of data that is coming to you in real time and you want to somehow summarize it, be able to analyze it, raise alarms, things like that. Um, tele telephone uh, call records, so is another example of a data stream where now the data fits uh, into customer bills as well as settlements, settlements between companies. So it becomes interesting, how would you identify all the calls a given person made or how do you write the call to the to the, to the record of the appropriate person. And then of course in networking, like in IP networking, uh, packets and how would, a, how would a switch monitor packets that go through it? How would, you, uh, how would it gather information about optimal routing? How it would detect s the denial of service attacks and so on. So again, all examples of problems on streams. So the first topic I want to cover today is to talk about how do you sample from a data stream. It's a very, very basic question. And what we want to do is we want to sample first a fixed proportion of elements from the stream. And the idea is that, right, as the stream will get bigger, our sample will also get bigger. So this is kind of the simple case of what you do, right? So one strategy you could use is to say, because I cannot store the entire stream, I will create some sample of the stream, right? And uh, there are two problems here, right? First is to say, I want to sample a fixed proportion of elements in the stream. So you say, I will save every one out of 10 elements in the stream on average, right? And this is an easy case, right? So the way you would do this, I will explain the next slide. But you can imagine an element comes in, you flip a coin and you decide to save it or throw away that element from the stream. But here is a more interesting use case where you say, I want to maintain a random sample of fixed size over a potentially infinite stream, right? So you would say, at any time k, I would like to have a random sample uh, of f of s elements over whatever is the stream that I have seen so far, right? So what is the property that we would like to maintain in this case is to say um, the following. I would say for any time step k, I would like each of k elements to be selected in my sample with equal probability, okay? So I will let this sink in a bit because basically the idea is I have seen k elements, I want to sample s out of them. Now I have seen k plus 1 elements, I want now a random sample out of this set of k plus 1 in my sample. Now I have seen k plus 2, I still want a random, now I want a random sample from this k plus 2 elements in my, 
uh, sample of S elements, right? So this is, and what is the property? The property is that out of all the elements I've seen in the stream so far, each one of them appears in my fixed size sample with equal probability, okay? Um, and I will uh, first talk about number one, and then we'll talk again about number two. Okay, so sampling a fixed proportion, the way the scenario here is, um, imagine I'm a search engine, I'm given, um, I'm having a stream of queries. And every stream, every query for me is a tuple of user, query, and time, right? User is the user ID, query are the keywords in the query, and time is when this, when this query was issued, right? Um, and maybe I would wanna ask a question, how often did a user run the same query in a single day? Right, I wanna ask, how often did a user write the same, uh, uh, wrote or ask the same query um, uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a single day? So I typed in the, the same query multiple times, right? And imagine I have a space to store one tenth of all the query stream in a given day. I cannot store the entire stream of queries, right? So what would a naive solution to this problem be? Naive solution would be to say, let's generate whenever a query comes in, let me generate a random integer between zero and nine, in, and if the, if the integer that I, I generate is zero, I store the, the tuple, otherwise I throw it away, right? A very simple way, how do you do a one-tenth random sample? You generate a random number, and then, you know, you take it. If it's zero, otherwise you throw it away, because it's between one and one, uh, zero to nine, so ten different things, you will store about one-tenth of the stream, right? So here is a problem with this naive approach that basically when you do sampling, you have to think quite a lot about what your query is and how this changes your answer. So imagine, right, I asked before, how, of, how many times do I get duplicate queries, right? So you could say, what fraction of unique queries in a, uh, by an average search engine user are duplicates, right? I would like to say in a given day, there is so many different queries asked and what fraction of them are duplicates, were asked multiple times, right? So imagine that every user issues X queries in a day once and D queries twice, right? So in our hypothetical example, um, every user issues X plus two times D queries, the X queries are issued once, and these D queries, each one of them is issued twice, so the total number of queries per, per user would be X plus two times D. And then if you would ask, if I have this hypothetical user, and I ask what is the answer to my query, which would be say, what fraction of unique queries issued by a user are duplicates? It would be D over X plus D, right? D is the number of duplicates, X plus D is the number of unique queries issued by user, according to this simple um, hypothetical use case, okay? Everyone happy? Yeah, okay? So. Just like this is a hypothetical thing, right? So now imagine that I say I want to answer this query. Imagine the reality is like this, but I will only do this on a 10% sample of my, of my queries. So I won't do this on the full stream, but I'll do it on a 10% sample using the method of sampling that I showed in the previous slide, right? So then what is, what will be the problem? The problem will be the following, right? My sample, because it's, it will contain one tenth of the query sex. Right, because each of, the, each of the queries is sampled with probability one tenth. And uh, uh, right, these are the singleton queries and it will contain two times D divided by, by 10 of the duplicate queries at least once. Right, because every user is asking X plus 2D queries, one tenth of that is X over 10 divided by uh, plus uh, 2D over 10, okay? So it's a one tenth of the, of the, query, of the query instances that I'm sampling. But what is interesting if you ask how many duplicate queries will be in my, in my sample, it won't be D over 10, it will be D over 100. And why is that the case? The way you convince yourself is that in order to sample a duplicate, the first element, the first instance of the duplicate has to be sampled and then happens with probability 0.1. And then the second instance of that duplicate also has to be sampled. So that happens with probability 0.1 and then this hap and I have D, such instances, so I multiply by D, so this is D over 100, right? So what does this mean? It means that out of the D duplicates, only 18 D divided by uh, 100 appear exactly once in my, in my query, and, and then the, uh, the D over um, the remaining, the remainder appears twice. 
So this means that if I would r do my uh, answer my query uh, above using my sample, I would do the counting, the, the, the answer I would get wouldn't be the correct answer, right? The, if I would just say in my sample, how many queries do I see appear once? How many queries do I see appear twice? And then I would do this ratio, I would get the wrong answer. The correct answer because of the sampling is that the duplicate queries actually appear with probability, with 100 times smaller probability than what they should because of the sampling. So after I would compute D and X, the, 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 the sample based answer would be D divided by 10 X plus 19 um, times D, right? So I would get a wrong answer, right? I wouldn't get the correct answer for the, rec the correct fraction of unique, uh, the, the correct fraction of duplicate queries. So basically what I'm saying is that whenever you sample um, and you have to really think about what is your query and what does the thing you want to compute over that sample, what does it mean, right? And in this case, because we are saying how many duplicates are there, this means that we are asking about dependencies between, between samples. So it means that duplicates appear with far smaller probability than what, what, what they do in the, in the real data set, right? So all I'm saying is um, you have to be very careful how you sample depending on what is the query you want to answer, right? So if you want to answer this type of query, then, then sampling the queries at random, sorry, if you want to ask this type of a uh, answer this type of a question, then sampling queries at random is the wrong approach. And the right approach for this solution would be is to say, let me sample one tenth of the users and then let me take all their queries. And if I do this, then I'm able to answer my question, the blue one up there correctly over the sample, right? Because this is really about how many, fra what fraction of the duplicate of the queries per user are duplicates. So it's a per user question and here, we, we proposed to sample the queries by ignoring the users, so that's why we would get the wrong estimate. But if I would sample users, then I would have all the queries for a given user, I could just count for every user and I would get the estimate, right? And then take the average and that would be it, right? So the point is, if you sample, you have to be very careful how you sample depending on the question you wanna ask, right? And now how would you sample users? One option is that you would have a hash function that takes the username or user ID and uniformly hashes, hashes it to one of the 10 buckets. And you know, if it hashes into bucket number seven, you save that user and all their queries. So this would be a strategy how to, you know, answer the question. This is the wrong way to do it. Sampling the users is the right way to do it. And the reason why I gave you this story is just to, to, uh, to, to get you to this point that you have to think how you sample depending on the question you want to answer, right? And just uh, naively randomly sampling will give you wrong answers in certain cases, like in the case I showed, okay? Now, uh, now the one more thing is how do we generally, how can we sample a fixed proportion of elements from the stream? The best way usually is to use, to use, uh, to use hashing, right? If you want to randomly sample over a given universe of keys, the best way to do that is that you just take that key, hash it, and then, um, and then uh, depending on what bucket it lands, you decide whether to save that or not, right? And this means that basically the choice of the key that you are hashing will depend on the application, right? If you want to uh, hash, uh, sample a random set of users and users are not numbered one to n, then the best way to do it is to hash a user to a bucket, and if it hashes to a bucket, you save it. And you don't even need to know how many users are there, you will save a fixed proportion of all the users. Because random uh, hash functions, what is their property? Is that they randomly distribute the data into buckets, but in a consistent way, right? So hashing allows you to do random sampling uh, really well. So this is, this is what, I, what I wanted to say, and you know, to talk about uh, how, how, do you, how do you do a particular, you know, A over B fraction uh, sample of the stream? It's uh, simple, right? You would uh, hash each key, each tuple of things over which you want to sample uh, uniformly into B buckets. And then you'd say, I will pick a tuple if its hash value is in the first A buckets, right? And this way you save A uh, over B fraction of the stream, right? Um, so, you know, how would you generate a 30% sample? You would hash into 10 buckets and you would save if you uh, hashed 
if your tuple hashed into one of the first three buckets, okay? Um, are there any questions about this? Happy? You're sleeping? How about this size? I <laughs> Good, I go on. So this was about sampling a fixed proportion of the data of the data stream. Now we'll talk about the second problem, which is sampling a fixed size. Uh, so creating a fixed size sample of a, of a data stream. So the idea is the following, right? As I've seen more of the stream, so this is maybe, you know, the stream um, up to now, and then I wait a bit longer and I see more of the stream. What I, and imagine I want to create a fixed set sample of S elements. I want conceptually to say, I have this, I have seen this much of the stream. Let me create, let me sample S elements from here at random. And now more of the stream has been revealed to me. And what I would conceptually like to be the case now is that I have a random sample of size S of this entire stream, right? So the idea is that I always have a random sample of the entire stream I've seen so far, okay? So this is called a fixed size sampling, right? So we wanna maintain a random sample S of size little S tuples, right? So, you know, I say I have a megabyte of memory or a gigabyte of memory, I wanna, devote this to my random sample of the stream, and that is how big of my sample I want it to be. Why would I want to do this? Maybe I don't know the length of the stream in advance. So I don't know at what ratio to sample my fixed proportion, so I will just say I want a fixed size sample of the stream, right? And now let's say that by time n, we have seen n items, right? We have read n elements of the stream. What I would like to do is that each item that is in the sample S is there with equal probability S over N, right? So if I've seen N items, I want to sample S out of them, out of them into my sample. So each one of them will be in my sample with probability S over N, right? And I want my sample to have this property for any N, right? As I see more of the stream, N will keep increasing but my sample will always be random, right? Everything that is in the sample is there with probability n s over n, which is the amount of the stream I've seen so far, right? So the way to think of this is the following. Imagine I want to create a random sample of size two. So maybe I've seen this much of the stream so far. So I want out of these five, uh, I want to create a random sample out of these five elements. Right, so each of the, each of the two, if each of the elements in the sample is there with probability two over five. And then, you know, maybe now two, two time steps later, I've seen this much of the stream. I still want a random sample of size two, but now each one of the seven is in my sample with equal probability, right? So the, the idea is that I want always to have this property that whatever is the amount of stream I've seen, my sample is a random sample out of whatever has been revealed to me so far, right? So an impractical solution for this would be to store the entire stream we've seen so far, and after new element comes, we would create, we would create a new sample where we would pick S of this entire stream of elements at random, okay? So now the sample is always fixed, but each element appears in the sample with lower probability as the stream gets bigger, okay? So now how do you do this? Here is a cool algorithm. This algorithm goes the name uh, under the name of reservoir sampling, and here is, here is how it is, right? So the first thing I will do is, if I want to create a sample uh, of size S, then uh, the first thing I will do is um, um, I will uh, keep, uh, 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 keep running, and I will just take the first n minus uh, n elements, and I will throw them in the, in the stream, right? And uh, now let's suppose that we have seen n minus one elements so far, right? Let's assume we have a random sample of the n minus one elements. Now the element n arrives and you know, n is greater than s, right? And then what will I do? I will do the following thing. With probability s over n, I will keep uh, this new element, this last element, otherwise I will discard it. And if I decide to keep it, then what I will do is I will take one of the existing elements from the sample, throw it away, and replace it with this last guy, okay? So I'll, I'll say again. So the idea is the following. Um, the stream is coming to me. I want a sample of size S. So the first thing I will do is I will take the first S elements and just put them in the sample. Now the element S plus one 
or in uh, um, arrives. I will, uh, I will decide whether to keep it or throw it away. I will flip a coin and with this particular probability, so s over n, where n is the amount of stream I've seen so far, I will keep that element. Otherwise, I will throw it away. And then if I decide to keep it, I will go into my sample, pick a random guy in the sample, throw it away, and I will replace it with, uh, with the element from the stream. Okay? So uh, the claim of this algorithm is that this algorithm maintains a sample s that has the desired property. What is the desired property? Desired property is that after n elements, the sample contains each of the elements seen so far with probability s over n. So we truly maintain a fixed size random sample over the stream of n elements, where n can be, uh, can, can keep growing, right? Um, are there any questions? Is it kind of clear what the algorithm is? Yeah? Okay, right, so the idea is I have a random sample, new, new, new doc, new element arrives, and I would still like to maintain the property of the random sample, of the random sample, so here is what I do. I decide to toss the element or I decide to keep it, and then I replace it with one of the existing elements in the sample. So now what I want to do is I want to prove that this is true. Yes? So the n is a fixed number? No, 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 n is, n, n is uh, how many elements have you seen in the stream so far? So n grows, right? N is just running. Even S is fixed. Yeah, if you print the nth element, then you uh, randomly discard one from the Same. original pool. Then the whole total size is going to increase. Exactly, that's the point. Oh, got okay. it. Exactly, the point is that my total sample size does not increase, right? The point is that if I've seen, I, ha I say I will sample a thousand elements, I've seen one million of them, so my sample has the property that out of this one million so far, each one of them is in my sample with equal probability. Now I wait some longer time, maybe my n is now 10 million, and at the 10 million mark, I still have a sample of 1,000 elements, but now each of these 1,000 is, is in, is, uh, is basically my, the property is that out of the 10 million seen so far, each one of them is in my sample with equal probability. Of course, that probability is now smaller because I have one out of 10 million, not, uh, or s out of 10 million. So small s is fixed. S is fixed, exactly, sample oh. size is fixed but n is growing. That's super cool. It's great that you asked me that actually, because this is a super important point, right? Great, anyone else? All right, great. You can scratch yourself. Okay, great. So here is how we'll prove this, right? So we'll prove this by induction, right? So the idea is the following. Assume that after you have read n elements, the sample contains each element so far with probability s over n, right? This is the random sampling idea, right? If I have a bag of n elements and I want to create a sample of size s, then if this sample is random, each one of these n elements is in the sample with equal probability. That's the, that's the hypothesis. What we need to show is that now after we have seen one more element from the stream, the element m plus one, uh, the sample maintains the property. The sample maintains the property, which means now that every element in the sample is there with probability s divided by m plus one. Right, because now the stream length is m plus one. Before the stream length was n, now we added one more element. So now the stream length is m plus one. So now each, each one of the guys in the stream, is, uh, in the sample, is now there with lower probability because the stream just got a one uh, element longer, okay? So um, first, the base case, right? Let's say that n equals to s, right? We have just, we are reading in the stream and we have seen first s elements of the stream, right? Then what we will do is we'll just, every of these uh, s elements gets just put in the sample. Because we put everyone in the sample, the probability that they are in the sample is s over s, which equals one, right? So after we have seen s elements of the stream, we have our random sample just, that just contains everyone. With what probability are these guys in the sample? They are there with probability one. So this works great. Okay, so this is our base case. Now we need to go to the inductive hypothesis, right? And the inductive hypothesis is that after n elements, the sample ends s contains each element seen so far with probability s over n. And now when element n plus one arrives, we have to reason about what, what will happen after it arrives. So our inductive step will be the following. For elements already in S, the probability that our algorithm 
keeps them in S is the following, right? Like how can a element stay in S, right? The way, the way an element can stay in S is that the new element that arrived into the stream, we, disc we discard it and we do nothing, right? H what is the probability of that happening? This is probability of keeping the, the element in the stream. So one minus that is probability of discarding it, right? So if we discard it, the sample remains untouched. So uh, the, uh, the elements in the sample remain there. So this is the probability that we, that the, the element m plus one that just arrived, we throw it away and the sample remains intact. Okay, and then what if we decide that uh, the other um, uh, kind of complementary event is to say, let's keep the, uh, the element uh, m plus one. So we keep it with probability s over m plus one. So the same as we had here. So let's keep it. And if we decide to keep it, then we have to take an existing element from the sample and toss it out. Uh, what's the probability that that, uh, um, that element in the sample is not picked, um, it is s minus one over s, right? So one, one guy gets picked, so this is one minus one over s, right? Or if you rewrite it differently, it's s minus one over s. So this is the probability that the element is not picked. And if you, so, if you solve this, if you simplify it, you get n over n plus one, okay? So what does this mean? This means at time n, n tuples in S were there with probability S over N, right? And then as the time, as, as another element arrived in the stream, as N increased to N plus one, a tuple stayed in the, in the sample with probability N over N plus one. So this is here, right? So now if we, if we put this, to, this together, this means that the probability that tuple is in S at time N plus one is the following, is the probability that it was there um, before, before at time n, and now this is times the probability it stays, the, it stays there as, after we've seen n plus first element. And if you multiply this, this cancels out, and you get exactly what we wanted, you get s over n plus one. Okay, so this is now the probability that the item is in the sample. It's the probability that it was there at the, at the time n, which is our inductive hypothesis, and then it's the probability that it stayed as, as the new element arrived. This is the probability that the element stayed in the sample. If I multiply the two, this is the kind of the total probability that the element, that the, that the element is in the sample at time n plus one. And it's s over n plus one, which is exactly what we wanted, right? We started with s over n, one time step happened, and now everyone should be in the sample with s over n plus one, which is exactly what we wanted, yes? Deductive hypothesis doesn't that include all the elements we've seen at the, like in the deductive step. We need to include all the elements we've seen after the n plus one step, and the expression below is just all the elements we've seen up to the n step, and then the probability that it stays. Shouldn't that be also plus the probability that the new element comes in? Uh, no, no. So, uh, like the the point is, I have a sample with a given property. And now I'm saying one more element has came in, right? The time has increased by one. What happens to the sample, right? So if I assume I had a good sample, after I execute one step of my algorithm, I still have a good sample, right? That's the point. Before I was assuming my, my elements are there with probability s over n. Now the length of the stream increased by one. So everyone who's in the sample should be there with probability s over n plus one. And I have just derived that that's the case. Right? And now, you know, this is my new n and the new n plus one can happen. All right? Good question. Thank you for asking. Great. Please uh, raise your hand and, and don't be afraid to ask. Okay? So this is what I wanted to say about sampling from a, from a data stream. Now I want to cover the second thing for today, which is answering queries over long sliding windows. Uh, and this will be a very kind of cool algorithm about trying to summarize a data stream. Right? So here is the setting now. So the setting is I, I have a stream and I have a window of length n of interest. And n is the n most recent uh, elements. Right? Let's say n being one million or n being one billion, all right? And uh, the idea is that this n is so large that I cannot store the last n elements in memory, okay? So, um, Right, maybe one option is to say let n be one billion and I wanna have, I don't know, another, another billion streams so I cannot now store one billion 
streams of each one of size 1 billion, okay? So what would be an example of this type of use case? Imagine that every product, if imagine I'm Amazon, and every product on Amazon is a separate stream. And we keep a vector of 0, 1, whether that product was sold in the nth transaction. Okay, so I have, I don't know, a million products, each product is a stream, and whenever the product is sold, we emit a 1, and if a product was not sold in that transaction, we emit a 0, okay? Um, and what do we want to answer? We want to answer how many times we have sold a product X in the last K, K or in the last capital N sales, right? I would like to know at any point in time to say how often did I sell product X in the last capital N sales, okay? Or capital N baskets, if you like, if you think about uh, frequent item sets and market basket analysis, right? So each product is a stream. I emit a zero if the product was not sold in that basket. I emit one if the product was sold in that basket. I want to answer queries that say, how many times did we sold X in the last capital N number of sales? Okay, that's the idea. So let me give you, um, give you how we could think of this. I could think of this is that I have a stream. I have a window region of interest of size uh, n, here let's say n equals 6. And the idea is that I want to now answer how many, uh, you know, how many, uh, something about what happens in this sliding window. And then as a new element arrives, this sliding window kind of moves one to the right, and you know, I would still be, need to be able to, uh, to, give, to give the answer. And then, you know, as the more of the stream gets revealed, this kind of sliding window moves to the right, right? And, uh, and so on and so forth, and at any point in time, I want to be able to answer something about the, the, the property of that stream, okay? And in particular, what, we'll, what we will consider is we will be given a stream of zeros and ones, and the, the, the question we want to answer over this sliding window of size n is how many ones are in the last k uh, k elements where actually we'll be able to, to take k to be any number between 1 and capital N, right? So we'll say for any subset of this region of interest of size N, I want to be able to answer how many ones are there in the last k elements of the stream, where now I'm assuming my stream is binary, only 0, 1, okay? Um, what would be the obvious solution? The obvious solution would be store the, the, the last capital N elements of the stream or the last K, uh, the last capital N bits because I'm assuming the stream is binary. And uh, you know, when a new bit comes in, uh, discard the oldest bit, save in the newest bit. And whenever somebody asks you a question about that bit, uh, that, uh, that window of interest N, you just scan through and give, give the answer, right? So you can think of it, here is my stream that's coming in, here is my, my region of interest, and I want to say how many ones are there in this region of interest, right? And uh, the, if I could store this entire window, then everything would be easy. The question becomes, what if I cannot store the window, right? And this is a real problem because many times you cannot store the window, right? If you are, if you are Amazon, you would, and this is now a sequence of in which transactions your product was sold, and you have, I don't know, 20, 50 million products, um, and you wanna, and you are making, I don't know, several million transactions a day, you cannot store all that, right? So the question becomes, what could you do to answer this type of sliding window queries if you cannot store the, all, the, all the elements of the window, right? So that's the, that's the question. What are we happy to do? We are happy with an approximate answer. We are happy to get an answer that may not be exact, right? Again, what are the queries we are asking? Over, over the last n elements of the stream, how many number ones can we, have we seen? That's the question, okay? So here is the way to think, is we are given this capital N, that is the region of interest. The, the stream elements are coming in from this side. At any point in time, I want to answer how many ones are there among the last capital N elements of the stream? That's the question, right? Um, one thing we don't want to do, we don't want to make a uniformity assumption, right? The idea is I don't want to create some kind of sample uh, of, the, of this last N elements or something and then try to somehow extrapolate, right? A solution I don't want is to say, let's maintain two counters. 
One counter will say how many zeros, how many ones have I seen from the beginning of the stream. Uh, another counter will say how many zeros I seen from the beginning of the stream. So if you want to ask me how many ones are there in the last n bits, I'll just say, you know, what fraction of elements seen so far are one. So I'll just take that proportionalize the size of the window. This would be a silly solution, and I don't want this silly solution because it assumes that the, that the stream is stationary. That basically the fraction of zeros and ones does not change over time. So this is a solution we don't wanna, we don't wanna make, right? We don't wanna make the assumption that the stream has an equal proportion of zeros and ones across, across time, right? That proportion can change over time, so the distribution of zeros and ones can change. So this is a unsatisfactory solution. It assumes the stream is, the stream is uniform, right? So this is what we don't wanna do. So here is uh, the method we'll talk, talk about. So this method is called uh, DGIM um, and does not assume uniformity. What it will allow us to do, it will allow us, if we want to, to monitor uh, n, a window of size n, um, which is n, a window of size n bits, then we will want to, to, to have storage that is logarithmic in the size, uh, in the size of the window. So the, si the, the, the amount of storage we'll require, it's uh, log n squared, right? So it's, I write it this way because it's uh, unambiguous. It says it's a log n overall squared, right? So it's squared in the logarithm of n, okay? Um, and the solution will give us an approximate answer, never off by more than 50%, right? So our error will be at most 50%. Right? So we'll be able, I'll show how we can further reduce this error factor to any, to anything above zero. Um, and what do I mean by 50%? This means that if we have 10 ones in the last n elements, then our estimate will be, you know, 10 plus minus five. This is what I mean by 50% error. This is the worst thing. We'll say there are five, but really there will be, um, there are 10 or we'll say 15 and really there are 10. Okay, so this is kind of, the worst case error for our algorithm. So now, how, what's the main idea for this thing to make it work? The idea is to have exponential size windows summarizing the stream. That is the idea. The idea is I will take the stream and I will summarize it by exponentially increasing regions, parts of the stream, um, and I will do this uh, backwards. And the idea is that I will drop regions um, at the beginning and merge them into larger regions, and I will drop regions that go away, f that kind of cross my region, my, my region of interest. So let me give you an idea. So imagine this is my stream, it's uh, the elements are arriving here, and this is my n. I want to answer queries over this region uh, of the stream, right? Then, so this is my n, and what I will want to do is somehow I will want to summarize my, uh, my stream with these exponentially increasing window sizes, right? I have a window of size one, I have a window of size two, another window of size two, I have two windows of size four, this is a window of size eight, and that's a window of size 16, right? And then, you know, what will I put in every window? I will put how many ones are there in that window, right? So in this window, there is zero ones. In this window, there is one one. In this window, Right? There is still one one, while in that window there are two ones. And then in this window of size four, right, between these two, there are two ones. So I write a two here, right? So, and so on and so forth, right? And then um, this is generally the idea, right? So this would mean that this is a window of size, size 16 that has six ones in it, right? So um, the idea is that in between here, there is six ones down here. Okay, so that's essentially the idea. And of course, where will, where will the error come from? The error will come from when we ask how many ones are here, this window will kind of stick off from our region of interest. So whatever ones happen in this case, we will kind of overcount them. And that's where the error will come from, right? The error will come from when, when our window, this exponentially increasing window stick over our region of interest, but we don't know how, where the ones are in this window. So we'll, this is where the error will come from. It will come from kind of from that part because we'll have it summarized, but we won't know what is happening in it, right? So now if you say, 
can we reconstruct the count of la last, uh, uh, last 10 bits? We can reconstruct the count exactly. The only thing we don't know is for these six ones, are they all here or are, are they all there, right? Like everything up to here, we can reconstruct exactly, right? I know that there is from here to here, there is 10 ones. I know there is two more. I know there is one more and that's it, right? So from here to the right, I can exact, I have my ones exactly counted, right? But from here to here, I also have my ones exactly counted. But I don't care about the ones in this region. I only care about the ones here, and that's where the error will come from. Yes? Uh, it seems like that would be true for other regions as well, like after the end of the four or the start. Of oh, yes, of course. I can also exactly reconstruct this thing, right? You can't reconstruct anywhere between the end of four and the end of ten. Uh, correct, but I don't care about that. Right now, I only want to reconstruct in the, in the end. Okay, so right now I have n fixed. What we will do later is to say, actually, I can do for any k inside n with some error, right? So I can pick any k here, and I will always have something sticking off, and that will be my error. So you are making exactly correct observation. Great. Um, I'm I'm just not there yet, but you're you, you're right. Okay, everyone excited? Okay. Um, even though you are excited, um, this doesn't work, right? Um, so I will have to fix it a bit, but this is a good idea, right? As I said, how do you ask, you were asking a question, if I set my k to be here now, you know, what is the estimate of number of ones from here on? It would be 4 plus 2 plus 1 plus 0. So I would say, you know, this is what, 7 ones from here to the beginning of the stream, and right? The, the number of ones from here to the beginning of the stream would be um, 6 plus 10 and so on and so forth, okay? That's essentially the idea. Mm, right? Um, and here's another example where I could say, okay, how many ones are from here? I would say, oh, it's 10 plus 2 plus 1 plus 0, right? And, and so on and so forth. You get the idea. So why is this good? First thing it's good, it only stores the log n uh, number of counts, right? Because I have this exponentially increasing windows. And for each count, for each, um, for each uh, window, I only need to store the number of ones in there. And if the window is of, uh, and if the total size of the stream that I'm interested in is n, then to store the count of ones, I need log base two n bits, and I need to store that log n times, right? Because I have log n buckets, right? Um, and it's uh, easy to update these windows as more bits enter, um, and error in the count is no greater than the number of ones in this unknown area, right? The area that is kind of sticking beyond the region of interest. Okay, so this is what is good. What is not good? Um, the problem is that as long as the, the ones in the stream are uniformly evenly distributed, then the error due to this unknown region um, is small. It will be no more than 50%. But um, it could be that all of these ones are at the end of this, are in this unknown region, and then my error could be, um, could be very, very large. Right? In this case, the error could be unbounded, right? Because all these guys could have count zero, and all the ones that, that I think I'm seeing are really in this part. So I would say there are six ones in my stream when really there would be zero ones. And that's an infinite relative error, right? So this, this is what you mean by the, by, the bound, by the error being unbounded. So this doesn't yet work, even though, as I said, you guys are excited. Uh, we need to fix it. So here's the fix up, right? The idea is that instead of summarizing the fixed length windows, we will um, summarize the blocks with a specific number of ones, right? So rather than say a block or a window, uh, if I go back, right? We won't say this is a block of size 16, so how many ones are in the block of size 16? We won't summarize fixed size regions of the, of the of the stream, but we will summarize variable size regions that have a fixed number of ones. That's the difference, okay? So we will say that the size of the block is not the, the length of it, but it is the number of ones in the, in the block, okay? And we will say that these sizes of blocks have to increase exponentially, okay? So 
what is a super important thing that you need to take uh, to, to, to remember is now we redefine what the block size is. Here, to me, block size was the number of elements it covered. So this was a block size of size 16, right? Because it says 16 elements. And this is a block size of 2 because it has 2 elements. Now I change the notion of block size where I say the size of the block is the number of ones in it. So for example, the size of this block is now 10 because there is 10 ones in it. Okay, so that's the conceptual difference. We won't be now summarizing blocks of fixed length, but we will summarize blocks of fixed size with a fixed number of ones. That's the idea, right? And the idea will be that when there are few ones, right, in the window, the block sizes will stay small, so the errors will also stay small, right? The blocks will be very long, but the, their size, number of windows in the block will be small, okay? So, the, so here is one way how to think about this summarization, right? I have two blocks of size 1 and I have one block of size 2. Even though this block is of length 3, it has two ones, so it's of size 2. Then here I have another block, it's of, of length 6, right? It has 6 elements, but it has 4 ones, so this is block of size 4. And this is another block of size 4 because there is 1, 2, 3, 4 ones in here, even though this has length 7, right? There is seven elements in here. This is now a block of size 8 because there is eight ones in here and another block of size 8 because there is eight ones in here, okay? So notice the difference from before. Before the block lengths were exponential. It was 1, 2, 4. Now the block sizes are exponential where size is the number of ones in the, in the, in the block and we just ignore the zeros, okay? So that's the idea, right? Um, so this means that um, the way we'll think about this is each bit in the stream has a timestamp and we will record the timestamps modulo n so that we will be able to where n is the size of the region of interest, right? And then this means that we can represent any, any timestamp with the, uh, with the, lo with the log base 2 number, uh, number of bits. Yes? Why is it that you only have like one block that's like yellow and like- Oh, uh -huh. great. Why do I only have one block that is yellow? I will explain why. Uh, it's a great observation. Before I had two blocks of everything. Now I'll have just one block of, of, uh, of yellow. Uh, this is correct. I'll explain why. I haven't yet, but I, I will do that. Thank you. Uh, it's a good question. Uh, we will, it's a, it will be at the core of the algorithm to have a variable number of blocks and we'll be merging, merging them as they go along. That will be the idea, okay? So what I wanna say is I wanna be able to, to save the, the, the position, the length of the block in log n bits because I can take the, I can do mo modular arithmetic. And then the way I will think of this is I will no, have this notion of a bucket which um, uh, is a record consisting of the time step of the end of the bucket and the number of ones between the beginning and the end of that bucket, right? So this will require me to store log n, log log n number of bits, right? So now to your question, I will have the following constraints on your, on the buckets. I will say that the number of ones in the bucket, so bucket size must be a power of two. And uh, this explains why I need log log n bits, right? Because uh, if the size of the, of the buckets is uh, a power of 2, I j just need to know the value of the power, right? So I have, uh, this is a block of size 4, another one, a block of size 2, and two blocks of size 1, okay? So that's, that's how I think of this, right? Now, the question is how do I represent a stream with a set of buckets? I will say that I can have either one or two buckets of every size, okay? Buckets do not overlap in timestamps and buckets are sorted by size, which means that earlier buckets are smaller and later buckets are bigger. And the idea is that buckets disappear when their end time is beyond n, right? So this means that basically as, as the bucket leaves the region of interest, the bucket disappears. And we will now show how to maintain this set of properties. To give you an example, right? Here is my stream as I had it before. This is n, my region of interest. 
I will have, right now I have two buckets of size one, one bucket of size two, two, si two buckets of size four, two buckets of size eight, and one bucket of size 15, the, uh, sorry, 16, that is uh, hanging off uh, uh, from my region of interest. As I said, the size of the bucket is the number of ones in the bucket. So even though this bucket has length seven and this bucket has length six, they have both size four because there is four ones in each of these two buckets, okay? Um, now I will repeat what are the properties of the buckets that I want to maintain is that I either have one or two buckets with the same uh, size, right? I have two here, I have two here, and I have one yellow. Um, buckets do not overlap, right? So you see these buckets don't overlap. They can touch, but they don't overlap. And they are sorted by size, right? There is two, four, uh, two, uh, one, two, four, uh, eight, 16, and so on, right? So they are, they are increasing as I move further back into the history of the stream. So now, how do I update buckets, right? Here is how I update buckets, and then I'll give you an example, right? When a new, new bit comes in, we want to uh, drop the last oldest bucket if its end time is beyond, uh, is, beyond, uh, is beyond the region of interest, right? And then when a new, so this is what we do at the end, right? Like how we drop this thing, that's easy. The question now happens as the new element appeared here, what do we do? There are two cases. If the new element that appeared at the beginning of the stream is zero, then nothing, we don't need to do anything, right? If a zero appears, all we care is the number of ones, so we can ignore the, z the zero, everything is fine, right? The interesting thing happens, what if the current bit that just appeared at the beginning of the stream has the value one? Then here is what we have to do. We have to create a new bucket of size one just for this bit, right? And correctly set its timestamp. And then now what this may create is that this may create that now we have three buckets of size one, right? We had two before, now the new one arrived, we created the third bucket of size one. So we are violating our rules. So what do we need to do is we need to go and combine two oldest buckets of size one into a new bucket of size two. And what that may create is now that we have three buckets of size two. So again, we need to take the last two buckets of size two and create a new bucket of size four. And we need to run this until, until uh, we have at most two buckets of every size, okay? And, uh, and that's it. So let me give you um, an example. Um, so here is how to see this slide. So I'll show you um, the current state of the stream. Here it is, right? Here, is the, here are the elements of the stream. Um, from your uh, right to the, to the left, these are my buckets as I had before. And then what will happen is that a new element will arrive to the stream, right? So here this number one arrived. So what do I do? I create a new bucket of size one. And uh, now what happens is that I have three buckets of size one. So what do I need to do is to take these two last two buckets of size one and create a new bucket of size two, right? So now I have one bucket of size one, two buckets of size two, and then two of four, two of eight, and so on, okay? And everything is good. I'm not violating any of my rules, right? Now, let's say another one arrived, right? So, sorry, right, I had this one. Um, so I was here, I was, uh, I was, uh, where was I? I was here, and now let's say another one arrived, a zero and a one, right? When the first, when the second one arrived here, I created a new bucket of size one. I have two of size one, everything is good. Then a zero arrives, everything is still fine. Now another one arrives. I again create a new bucket of size one, but now I have three buckets of size one. So I have to join these two buckets into a yellow bucket. Uh, let's see how did I do my, right? So I join these two into a yellow bucket. Now I have three yellow buckets. I cannot do, so I need to join these two into a, uh, into a bucket of size four, into a violet bucket. So I do that. Um, and, and uh, now I would have three buckets of, um, 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 I would now, so basically what would happen now is I would have um, uh, three buckets that are, that are of, si uh, of size uh, eight. So what I would need to do is also join these two buckets into a bucket of size 16, right? And after all this joining, here is the current state of the stream, right? 
I basically, what happens is that cascading in a kind of a cascading way, I'm joining these buckets so that at never point in time I have more than two buckets of each size. Okay? So um, this is the idea, right? Here I skipped a couple of steps, but after all the merging is done, this would be the state of the stream. Okay? Do people see was my animation good enough? Yes? You have a question. So, so do we stop the merging when we merge at end divided by two sides? No, we stop the merging <laughs> until um, so huh. Uh, when do we stop merging, right? We stop merging when uh, when uh, when we will have at most two buckets uh, two buckets of every size. Right? So here I have two of size 16. I have no buckets, no buckets of any size that there would be three of them. Right? So now when we, what does this mean? These are exponentially increasing, increasing buckets. So it means that the number, the total number of buckets is, is log, log n number of buckets that we have. Right? But all I have to worry about is that when I have three buckets of a given size, I merge them. Right? Now I would, I would have three violet ones, so I take the last two and I merge them. Now I have three of the pink size, I have to take the last, the last two of the pink size and merge them. Now I have two blocks of size, um, of size 16, I don't have three, and I'm done. Okay? No, you won't be merging buckets beyond your region, because if the bucket is beyond the region, you have already removed it. Right? So, of course, the bucket may, may hang over, right? Like, that, that, this is where the region might end. That's okay. Okay? Good. So this is how this works. So now, how do you query this thing? And the way you query this thing is the following. The, the estimate of the number of ones in the region of interest of size n is the following. It's the size of the, sum of the sizes of all buckets but the last bucket, right? Where size means the number of ones in the bucket plus half the size of the last bucket, right? Um, and the reason why we take uh, half the size of the last bucket is because we don't know how many ones in the last bucket are still inside the region of interest. That's why we take half the size of the last bucket. Let me give you an example. If I have this stream, this is the size, this is the, the, the size, uh, uh, these are my buckets, and I want to say how many ones are there in this uh, stream of size, uh, of in region of interest of size uh, n, then this would be, um, I would say this is uh, 1 plus 1 plus 2 plus 4 plus 4 plus 8 plus 8 plus uh, 16 divided by 2. That's my estimate. Okay? So essentially, I sum up the sizes of all the buckets beforehand, and I take half the size of the last bucket. Okay? Um, good. So what I will do next is I will convince you that the, that the error of this is at most 50%. But before I do that, are there any questions? Okay, so what we have learned so far is how to create these buckets of fixed size, how do we merge them as elements come at the beginning of the stream, and then uh, how do we estimate the count for a given n. Okay, we are happy with that? Yes? Okay. So now, why is the error of this method um, less than less than 50%? Right? We say, uh, let's prove or let's convince ourselves that the error um, is, is at most 50%. Like, and the way we reason about this is the following. Let's say that the last bucket has size 2 to the r, right? The number of ones in the last bucket is 2 to the r, right? Then by assuming that half of the bucket uh, are, are uh, ones, so this means 2 to the r minus 1 is the, is uh, of its ones are within the, la within the last window, within the window uh, region of interest, we can make an error of at most 2 uh, raised to the power of r minus 1, right? Um, why, why is that the case? Um, s this is the case because since there are at least, there is at least one bucket of every size, um, um, and these sizes are less than 2 to the r. So it means there is a one bucket of size 1, one bucket of size 2, all the way to one buck at least one bucket of size 2 to the r minus 1. If you sum up these exponential numbers, you get 2 to the r minus 1. Okay? So this means that there are at least, 
this many ones in the stream plus half of the, of the ones in the, in the last bucket, right? So this means that our error can be at most 2 to the r minus 1, and we know that there are at least 2 to the r ones in the bucket. So this means that our error will be at most 50%, right? Um, and that's why having this exponentially increase, increasing windows really is important and allows us to make accurate um, estimate, right? To give you an example, right? Essentially what we are, what we are saying is that the number of ones here will be um, the sum of these window si block, um, block sizes, it will be equal to the size of this block. And then it means if we take half of it, this means that at most the, the other half hangs off. So this would be kind of the worst case scenario, right? Where up to here our count is accurate, and then from here on our count is kind of all the, all the ones are hanging, are hanging off except, except this one, which is the beginning, beginning of the stream, right? So if this has 16 uh, ones, then if I take half of it, I make an error of at most 50%. That's, uh, that's the way to think about this. So now, how would you further reduce the error of this method? Like what could we do to bring the error to be less than 50%, right? The idea is that rather than maintaining, the allowing at most one or two buckets of each size, I could allow more buckets of each size. I could allow um, R minus one or R, where R is some param parameter buckets of each size. And if I do that, then my error is at most one over R, right? In our case, we allowed R to be equals to two. We allowed only two buckets of each size. So our error was 50%. If you would allow 10 buckets of each size, then you, your error would be 10%, okay? Of course, your storage cost would increase, um, but, uh, but the number, the, but the estimate in your, um, in your, your error, in your estimate in the number of ones would decrease, right? And by picking appropriate R, you're in some sense trading off between how much, how many buckets you store and what is the error of your estimate, right? The more buckets you can store, the bigger the R you can make, the lower the error of your estimate will be, okay? Good, are there any questions about this? So if no, then let me give you one more extension, right? Imagine the, so far we only talked, uh, talked about um, the, uh, answering the queries over this region of interest of fixed size n. What if you wanna answer queries over any region k where k is less than capital N? This was the question you had before, right? So, and it turns out that yes, you can do so, right? So the idea is, Rather than saying, oh, I can only uh, re answer queries for this particular capital N, we can really answer queries for any K that is less th than this capital N. And the way we answer a query to say how many ones are in the last K elements, it's similar to what we did before. It is the sum of bucket sizes before K plus half of the size of the, of the last bucket that is kind of hanging off from the region of interest. So this means we can do this for, um, for, any, for any K that is less than capital N, right? So we can answer this type of query of the number of ones for any K that's less than the total region of interest cap uh, capital N, right? I'm, it's kind of obvious why we can do this, right? Because essentially we have this exponentially um, increasing regions summaries and then if I wanna answer how many ones are here, I sum up the sizes of everything here and take the half the size of the last bucket that is kind of hanging over, okay? Good questions. So this is one extension, a very natural one, right? It's just, we can do, we can, we, like, we can, we can answer queries for anything uh, less than capital N. Um, then the, the last thing I wanna ask is, can we handle cases where the stream is not bits but integers? And we let's say we wanna know the sum of the last k elements, right? I would like to know what is the sum of the last k elements of the stream, okay? 
So here is the assumption. The assumption is that stream is a, has, a, has positive integers like um, uh, um, one, five, and so on. And we want a sum of the last k elements. Again, for any k less than capital N. Uh, why would I want to do this? Because imagine I want to compute the average sale price of the last k, 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 k transactions I did, right? For any value of k. You come to me and say, I want to know the, the sum of the, uh, the average of the last 42 transactions. This is essentially sum of the last 42 transactions divided by 42. And then somebody else says, oh, I want 48. We should be able to give them an answer essentially immediately. How would we do that, right? It is the streaming problem. Again, now we don't have a stream of zeros and ones, but we have a stream of, um, of numbers, of non-negative non, non or, yeah, non-negative integers, right? So there are two solutions. If you know that all uh, uh, n, uh, integers have at most uh, m, m bits, then what you could do is treat um, each uh, m bits as an, of an integer as a separate stream, right? So if you would say, I will want to have 64 bit integers, then I will have 64 streams. And then the way you would represent every, every integer, you'd represent, is represent it as a, as a vertical bit vector, right? And then the idea would be, right, that uh, you could now just count how many ones do you see in every of these streams. And then the sum you would get would be number of ones in that stream times two to the i, right? Where i is the index from, let's say, one to 64, right? And the reason this works is because you are basically saying, how often was the first bit turned on? How often was the second bit turned on? How often was the third bit? of the integer turned on, fourth bit and so on, right? So the idea is we represent every integer, um, every element of the stream as a, as a vertical bit string. And then for each of the bits, we have a separate, um, a separate stream. And now I'm asking in the last k, how often was that bit turned on? And this allows me to compute the estimate of the sum of the, of the stream, okay? So this is actually quite clever if you think about it, right? I take my integers, I represent them as bits, and now every bit position is a separate stream. Okay? People see this? Yeah, is it kind of clear? Maybe you draw it out and see it. Okay? And then the last thing I want to show is basically it's the buckets method, but I want to keep, rather than the number of ones in the bucket, I want to keep partial sums. And I will say some of the elements um, in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a bucket of size b is at most 2 to the b. That will be, that will be my notion definition of, uh, of size, right? So uh, here is the idea. The idea is that the sum in some of the elements in each bucket is at most 2 to the, two to the, two to the b unless a bucket has only one integer, right? And then, you know, the, the, we will have these buckets um, of different sizes where the idea is that the number of the, the sum of the of the entries in the bucket is two to the two to the b um, where you know b is one two three four and so on okay so the idea will be if this is now my integer uh, my string of integers I will have these buckets where you know I have uh, this is bucket of size one but, but um, I allow its size to be greater than one uh, because it's only one number. Then I have two buckets of size two. I have two buckets of size four, two buckets of size eight, and one bucket of size 16, right? In here, the sum is less than 16, right? The only place, place where this is violated is here because it's a single number in the bucket, right? But everywhere else, the, the, the size of the, the sum of the entries of the bucket is less than two to the B, okay? So now, right, as new, new entry appears in the stream, I would do kind of similar things. I would create a new bucket for the first thing. I would, uh, I would be now uh, violating that I would have three, three, and three uh, orange buckets. So I would, uh, uh, I cannot join this. So what I would do is I would keep this guy as a separate bucket and um, I would create a new bucket of size two here. Now I would have uh, three buckets of size two. Again, I couldn't, I cannot, uh, I try to join this and I get one bucket 
of size 4 and then I have the second, um, the second bucket of size, uh, uh, I would actually join these two to create a bucket of size 8. Here it is, I have again three buckets of size 8, so I have to join this bucket into a bucket of size 16 and I would have, I don't know, one, one more uh, bucket of size 16, right? So now here I'm joining these buckets where the, the sum of the elements in the bucket has been, has to be less than a given power of 2, okay? And the only place where this is violated is in this singleton buckets. And of course, um, as new, as new uh, elements arrive, again, I would be doing this type of, uh, this type of merging. Here I would say, oh, I have two, two buckets of size, of size two, so I can, I can stop. Again, I'm violating, but I can violate because I have only one number in the bucket, okay? And then when, uh, when, uh, when the query comes, for any k, I just sum up the sizes of the buckets and that is, that is my answer to the query. Um, and so on, and so on and so forth, right? So here is how this would uh, work out, right? So what did we learn? We learned four things or three things today. We learned how to sample a fixed proportion of the, of the stream. We sample from, and the idea here is that the, the size grows as the size of the stream, size of the sample grows as the si size of the stream grows. Then we talked about reservoir sampling, about sampling a fixed size sample where the size of the stream can grow, but the size of the sample is fixed. And then we talked about counting the number of ones in the last n elements of the stream. We talked about this idea of ex exponentially increasing windows, and we talked about two extensions, um, to, uh, some, uh, answering the number of ones in the last k elements of the stream when a k is less than this capital N, which is the input parameter. And then we talk about how do you not only count number of ones, but how do you keep track of sums of the, int of the last k integers or last capital N integers in the stream. So this is what the important points from today's lecture. Um, we will finish here. And then on Thursday, we will talk about some additional cool algorithms on the streams. Um, this is to end, and one last thing I will say is for people who are interested in CS341, we will be having a, a information session most likely next week on Wednesday at 6 p.m. And there we will present how the class goes, what are some example problems so that you guys can form teams and then propose, uh, propose projects. And based on your proposals, we will then admit you into the class. So I'll say more on Thursday at the beginning of the lecture. Um, and make proper announcement, but thank you.